Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of No Such Thing as a Fish. I'm quickly here to introduce you to our special guest this week, and that is Athena Kablenu. Now, you'll remember Athena, she's been on Fish a couple of times, uh, but one interesting new thing to say about her is she has a new podcast. Her podcast is called Why Does My Child Hate Me? <laughs> it's absolutely amazing. I think she got the name from uh, Reading My Mind at 6.30 this morning, uh, but it's a brilliant podcast. It's all about how we as parents are absolutely amazing and it is the children who are wrong. It's so good and you should definitely check that out. Uh, if you want to hear any more from Athena, you can get her on social media, on uh, Twitter and Instagram. Both of those places she can be found at Athena Kablenu. And just so you know how to spell her surname, it's K-U-G-B-L-E-N-U. Uh, not much more to say except we do have a live show coming up uh, it's at the British Library that's sold out but you can get streaming tickets so if you want to know more about that go to notionsthingsoffish.com and that's also the place to go if you want to learn about Club Fish a place where you get ad free episodes loads of extra bonus stuff and also you get to hear about the live shows first for instance the British Library show almost sold out uh, from just the people who listened to Club Fish and there was only a few tickets left for those who heard about it on the Friday so it's definitely a good place to go if you want to hear all of our news first anyway I really hope you enjoy this week's show I hope all is good with you enjoy our facts with Athena and on with the podcast <laughs> Hello and welcome to another episode of No Such Thing as a Fish, a weekly podcast coming to you from the QI offices in Covent Garden. My name is Dan Schreiber, I'm sitting here with Andrew Hunter-Murray, James Harkin and Athena Kablenu and once again we have gathered around the microphones with our four favourite facts from the last seven days and in no particular order, here we go. Starting with fact number one and that is Athena. My fact this week is... 15 million clothing items are dumped in Ghana every week. Like someone's come to your house with a cheap bottle of wine they're re-gifting, here you go, yeah. and you've got to re-gift it, and then they re-gift it, and there's a bottle of wine floating around the world being re-gifted over and over again because it's vinegary two pound rubbish, Ugh. and it's clothing. It's a good analogy, and it's a good job Anna isn't here because that's the kind of wine she loves. <laughs> <laughs> She'd be like, I would drink that wine. Um, but yeah, that's, I mean, it's it's absolutely huge. It's a huge amount, and they have huge sort of piles of it next to, there's one river in Accra. God, think, so it's it? like literally mountains of clothing. Yeah, yeah, wow. yeah. Yeah, and we've got a massive market where it's traded. Most of it's traded. Most of it's given away. But we don't want it. Like, no one, <laughs> like, just to be clear, this is unwanted. We want a little bit of it. Mm. But like, you just know, the good stuff, it's really. A, yeah, secondhand stuff is great, but it's stuff that we've inevitably bought from fast fashion suppliers for a very low amount of money. We've worn it once, we've thrown it away. We've gone into our wardrobes and we've gone, I don't want all these clothes. It's wasteful in my wardrobe. Let me take it to a charity shop, right? Guess what? The charity shop doesn't even want all your clothes. And mm. then it ends up from a charity shop into the back of a shipping container mm. um, and it gets shipped off to a country and one of those countries is Ghana. Yeah, wow. Mm, I, up until you uh, mentioning this fact, fast fashion, I'd actually not heard that term before and looking into it, uh, wow, what a, what a mad thing we're all in Involved in if you buy from high street shops back in the day you used to maybe buy four shirts and that would last you for months on end but now it's almost like six shirts a week for some people if they go wow. out and want for younger kids supposedly from surveys six a lot of kids want to be seen in different shirts on their mm. instagram they don't want to be seen see in the that, same yeah. thing so socially you are doing a turnaround of shirts that you might only wear once and then chuck away or give back to the shops who then don't resell them the stuff that goes to ghana i think like you say they kind of resell it and reuse it and stuff but 40 percent of it is such low quality that it just goes straight into landfill and you can't really truck it out of ghana at that stage so it gets dubbed in ghana yeah and don't forget there's not a huge amount of infrastructure in terms of like waste and recycling it's not like they can separate it into polyesters cottons repurpose it like it's if you want to take rubbish anywhere i swear to god Ghana is the last place you want to take it, yeah. it to be used yeah, yeah. in a in a useful way just on your point about how much we buy in the uk we buy two tons of clothing uh, every minute. Every minute, that can't be right. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. I got it off the Oxfam website. 
Wow. I found that we throw away 75 pounds of clothes every year Is that per weight person. Or? That's weight. That's about the weight of a male giant otter. <laughs> and <laughs> well, that does bring it home, actually. How big? Oh, otter's that big? They're huge. Well, They're the big. Giant otters, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. yeah, yeah. There's the, uh, there's the logo for the campaign against <laughs> wasteful clothing. But it may not seem a lot, but obviously there's 60 odd million people in the UK. Imagine 60 odd million giant otters. Again, James, I do think you've picked one of the worst and least known animals. <laughs> As in, if your reaction, if, the, if people's reaction to that fact is, are there giant otters? That is a problem with the campaign. Yeah, you know? you're right. It's a, it's a, because then you're immediately you talk about the otter. You're not talking about the clothes. If it, it's, and also, do we nice. need to be worried about them? Because, like, yeah, oh yeah, I mean, you know, they sound kind of aggressive. Yeah. Well, well, they, well, you need to worry about yourself if you're in a room with one. You know, definitely. they're six feet long, and if you're in a room with one, it's not in its natural habitat, which is the Amazon. Basin. They're, they're Brazilian, aren't they? The giant, giant otter. otter. It's happened. It's happened. We forgot about clothing. We're, yeah. we're in the world well, of otter. It's because the world of fast fashion is so, once you look at the stats, it's so upsetting that if, you know, James comes along with his brilliant campaign and poster, <laughs> you immediately want to think about the otter because. I would think maybe we can get you a costume, Andy. An otter costume? An otter costume and send you into H&M oh, and fuck wow. things up. I love that. <laughs> Be like um, Christ turning over the tables in the temple. Yeah, it was he in an otter yeah. costume? He was. They never mentioned. Well, three of the scriptures don't mention it, but John is always a bit more out there. He says, and, and yeah. Christ was uh, the Lord. That, that could be the new saying. Instead of a bull in a china shop, it's an otter in a in a Zara high street shop. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but you're right. The numbers are kind of heinous, and I, I didn't I didn't realise um, how it had happened in the first place. As in the way that lots of uh, big high street brands moved from having a few collections of clothes a year to now having new collections maybe every couple of weeks. Mm. And um, there's a firm called Shine, who I think if you know about fashion, you will know about them, but if you don't, you won't. And they're, they're an enormous Chinese firm who stock almost all their clothes, 94% of their clothes are stocked for 90 days or less. So they basically turn out thousands and thousands and thousands of designs, but they only make about 50 or 100 yeah. of each one. But in the first four months of last year, they added 315,000 different styles to their website. It's a clever idea wow. in a way. I mean, it's terrible for the world, but the idea yeah. is that one, you don't have lots of waste. They don't have lots of waste yeah. in their company because- Because you're only making 50 of them. Yeah, you're only thing. making 50 yeah. of them. You're probably gonna sell all 50, but also you're creating fake scarcity, which means that people, if you see someone wearing it on TV, you're like, well, there might be only 50 in my local shop, so I'm gonna have to get there fast and get yeah. one. So mm. At which point they'll make another 200,000, yeah. yeah. But 300,000 different pieces of clothing, as yeah, in different crazy. designs, in, in four months. That's crazy. And this is all the fault of one man. <laughs> One still alive, possibly very litigious man. So, is it? Uh, well, he, he might be. I'm about to slag him off. Let's name some names. His name is Amancio Ortega, and he is the founder of Zara, the high street shops are, that are global. When he invented Zara, the idea was he wanted fashion to be able to mimic fashion that was being seen in the catwalks at a much quicker rate. There used to be such a long period before anything even resembling what was seen on the catwalks would appear in shops. And he thought, what if we just quickly make them the turnaround? We have no name designers. They're all anonymous. They work for us in the back rooms. And let's get it out within a five week period. That will make us big. And then let's just make a few of them. We just constantly create demand for new items. And this caught on around the world. So it's this one guy who at one point became the richest man in the world, took over Bill Gates uh, for like a brief second. So he's he went from poverty to richest man in the world off yeah. this idea of fast fashion. One guy and one woman as well, uh, Rosalia Mira, who's Very his true. wife, yep. um, who did a lot of the work as well. Um, because they kind of got together, didn't they? Um, she was working in a clove shop. He was a messenger boy and they kind of- Can I very... make it any more <laughs> obvious? <laughs> But yeah, Ortega, he's a really interesting guy, I think, because some of it sounds quite sweet. Like he, he grew up, he was the son of a railway worker who would move around the whole of Spain working wherever there were jobs. Um, he was really poor as a child. He had only potatoes for some of his meals. Um, and he's very reclusive. He doesn't have a computer. He does all of his mm. work like in small groups and just kind of tells people what to do and, and mm. really doesn't write much down and stuff. But then on the other hand, he's a billionaire. <laughs> yeah. Well, we've made a, a great new enemy on this show today. <laughs> and, uh... You're welcome, guys. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it was in this tiny town and he wanted to call the company Zorba initially, but there was a restaurant that was selling beers and so on and down Greek the road. Food, and Greek food, food. It's more of a Greek than a Spanish name, isn't it? Um, well, Zorba the Greek. Zorba the Greek. That's what I'm thinking. But that's in... what they were naming it after. 
but there happened to be two places that wanted to do it in the very same street and so the restaurant said can you not do that please and so he went fine but they had the molds for zorba and so they quickly just rearranged it into zara so i guess they used the a twice out of zorba yeah, um, yeah. i guess that's how that works and threw um, away the b yeah, yeah, yeah. And the o. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah well they like waste so it doesn't matter <laughs> <laughs> yeah. start as you mean to go on guys stick it in the bin he um he's very reclusive he's been photographed i think once by the company the company have released one photo of him once <laughs> in about the year 2000 he is R- really very 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 private but uh, he appears to wear only the same items of clothing every day mm. he wears a pair of trousers a shirt and a jacket oh. none of which are sold by zara <laughs> no <Amazing>. exactly <laughs> and it's um it's kind of like that thing you know how all the tech squillionaires they all their children are growing up playing with simple wooden blocks and they've right. never seen a computer yeah. and they all go to schools where they they don't do any tech stuff but that it's also like that. it makes me also think of do you remember daniel radcliffe used to do that <laughs> after so when he came out on the west end uh, at the stage door every night yeah. he used to wear the exact same clothes so that the paparazzi couldn't sell a new photo because that photo could have been taken mm. any night oh. of the run oh, so clever. that was his that was Is his that strategy also why he doesn't seem to have aged over the last 30 years <laughs> <Yes>. he's <laughs> decided to freeze himself right. and yeah that's why you don't that's see many clever. photos yeah Okay, I'm just, I'm just floating a theory. Okay. Because obviously a lot of fast fashion is driven by high fashion and by red carpets and things like that. So if you're only allowed to wear one item of clothing on the red carpet for the rest of your life, mm. that would presumably go a long way to, well, a bit of the way to... Are we going to make people, whatever the last thing they wore, like Sam Smith, they're going to have to wear that kind of yeah. rubber thing? Yeah. Yes. Whatever, a certain date, you just freeze and that's your clothes now. Yeah, like a, a random bell to just go off on your phone or something. <laughs> like today's your time. And whatever yeah. you're wearing, like that's, <laughs> it's just, be, you know how you used, they gave us alerts when it was COVID, we'd get like these text message yeah. alerts from the NHS. Yeah. It should be a clothing alert. Right, this is you now. <laughs> this is your look. And it would incentivize um, people to always look their best because you might get frozen at any time. Yeah. yeah. That's a great you know, idea. I might not have worn this hoodie with my own podcast. But, yeah. I <laughs> but I do think we need to make it slightly less socially acceptable to just, yeah. the way, I used to have a friend whose wardrobe was just full of clothes with tags on. You right. know, she was just just a shoplifter. shoplifter. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, and then like the security tags. What? Does she have a tag on her ankle as well? <laughs> <laughs> now I think about it, she couldn't leave the house after six. Um, it's just socially acceptable to just mm. buy stuff. Yeah. yeah. My um, ex used to work in a clothes shop, and the t- number of times people would come back with an outfit saying, "Yeah, I haven't worn it because it didn't fit, and it would be covered in." red wine and vomit <laughs> <laughs> like no no we haven't worn it honestly we haven't worn it so, yeah yeah i know it's shameless watching the lies of a hungover person going, <laughs> yeah i didn't end up using it a lot of this just to go back to this, a lot of this waste is returned items too so yeah. even if you return items pristine they often can't be resold because yeah. the minute you open the packaging well it's not something they can really sell again so we in our brains think oh i'll try it on i'll send it back and it'll be okay it's not okay most of that does get dumped as well yes yeah. exactly and that's the big problem that no one realizes so it's exactly that it is literally online ordering you tried on ah no it's the wrong size that is now going into waste yeah they wow. won't reuse that um it's remarkable as well i was reading about how zara defines how they can make the fast fashion because it's not just looking at the bigger world of fashion high-end fashion like catwalks and so on basically the staff and this is from an article that was about 2012 so i'm I'm talking for you know this could have changed since then but the way they do it is staff have to monitor by listening carefully to what people are making little comments about i hate having those zips on the ankles i wish they would put them up here and if they would collate this stuff and all report back did you hear anyone else say that yeah i heard them say that they report that back to head office and then they just start designing clothes according to literally customer feedback within the shop because they come up with so many different designs mm. and then what they do at the big zara warehouse which is like an air hanger a new york times journalist went to visit it you would see people talking to the zaras of the world going red pants are they wearing red pants okay we're getting reports of red pants here great we're in red pant business now and they would make pants being trousers sorry uh, yeah, yeah. For- is that for english men over a certain age <laughs> in the countryside <laughs> going to the henley uh, regatta yeah, yeah. yeah. 14 That's year old girls huge. in china uh, 60 year old men at henley <laughs> zara have really been cracking the regatta <laughs> market and Han- uh, so if I go into a Zara and be like, God, I'd love a panda costume. Yeah. yeah. And if we all did it. <laughs> if we all did it. Sorry, then... we're getting a giant river otter costume. It's pretty clear, <laughs> <I> think, <yeah. laughs> okay, it is time for fact number two, and that is Andy. 
My fact is that Ford has just got a patent for a car which can repossess itself if the owner falls behind with payments. <laughs> <laughs> this is... God, this is quite a dystopian episode, isn't it? Yeah, it yeah. is. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, this is just a patent at the moment. Yeah. It may never be built, but it, it has been granted, as in they applied for it a couple of years ago and it's just been granted this year. Yeah. So here's the plan, right? You've got your Ford. Yeah. You think you're safe. You've you got it on a payment agreement. Payment you know? agreement. Yeah. You're doing okay, but then you miss a couple of payments. You miss a couple of payments. Something happens, and um, and they write to you, and you, and you don't acknowledge it. Maybe you missed the message. Yeah. Whatever. <laughs> right? But anyway, things steadily get worse for you and your car from this point onwards. Firstly, they just make the car a bit less pleasant to drive. In that, you know, they might disable the music uh, or the air conditioning. Or the GPS. Some of these things sound a little bit dangerous, but <laughs> at, this stage, fine. at this stage, you might just think it's a glitch, right? Yeah, yeah. You're like you, oh, my yeah. aircon's not working. You're doing your regular thing. It's not especially hot, so uh, and you don't like music. So fine. <laughs> so you're all right. But then it'll make an unpleasant beeping sound whenever you get into the car. Uh, okay, well that's a bit annoying. Sounds like the music I might have been listening to anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, your EDM <laughs> collection is fine. So great. Then it stops you using it at certain days or times, as in the car won't even function outside, oh, let's boy. say, ordinary working hours. So the, I think the plan is that you can keep going to your job uh -huh. so you can afford to catch up with your payments eventually, uh, but you can't, I don't know, socialize. Um, and then, as a very last resort, it will either drive to a waiting tow truck to be repossessed, <laughs> like it'll have an assignation <laughs> yeah. without you knowing about it, or if it's worth very little, it'll just drive itself to a scrapyard and oh say, my God. take me apart. Drive yourself to Ghana. That'd yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, that'd be good. We want cars. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, okay. That'd be great. Yeah. Um, wow. So this is the plan. Gosh, that's amazing. Like, yeah. It's incredible. And maybe it'll happen. What, what, <laughs> what's crazy is like, this. why can't technology be used for good? If we can control what cars are used and when they're used, what can't we do in the world right now? Modal shift. We can't get people out of their cars onto trains. So why don't we set these new electronic Wi-Fi connected cars of the future to like, you can be used for 10 hours a week. To run out of 10 hours, it won't work and you'll have to just uh, go to a field and touch some grass, right? <laughs> right. Why don't we use yeah, yeah, this yeah, for yeah. good? Yeah, they can yeah. only yeah. take you to the park and ride. <laughs> right, and yeah. To... <laughs> <laughs> but there's got to be a better way yeah. to use this technology rather than to just like make people destitute. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I got one slightly better way of using the technology, Go the self-driving technology. Oh, yeah, yeah. So if you've got a really busy road, it's kind of gridlocked almost, and everyone's <clears> kind of stop, start, stop, start, bad for the environment, bad for everything, right? Mm -hmm. You can put 5% more cars onto the road, but if they're all driverless and they're all smart and they know exactly how fast to go and which lane to be in, mm. they can stop the gridlock. Okay. Does that make uh, sense? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So, like, the cars will join the real cars, and they'll work out how everyone's behaving, and they'll move a little bit faster in this lane, a little bit slower in this lane, and suddenly all of the wow, like traffic big, jam will stop. Like a dance, like a yeah, synchronized. Exactly. I used to work in highways, and traffic modelling is mostly nonsense. Oh, is it? <laughs> well, it's not nonsense, but it's super. It's super vulnerable right. to change so I, I worked on this one project yeah and they it t they spent millions modeling this how this new road would work and everyone was great and then there was some crisis and petrol went up like 2p and the modern had to put in the bin like the, oh, the most the, really? the smallest change in the most random thing to do with driving you've got to put it all in the bin oh. and start again it's a really so a lot of policy and a lot of stuff is done based on these models but these models are so quickly yeah, um, made so redundant mm, yeah okay. but it, it is true that driver behavior does cause a huge amount of tra so like rubbernecking is a really a really mm. good example you're all familiar with people slow down to look at yeah, accidents yeah. because we're humans love it and, or, or stonehenge um, or stone oh sorry, yeah but i do that the a303 oh yeah a303 you know, it's so you guys are so bad at it they want to dig a tunnel underneath it like you guys are so just, just if you won't stop slowing down we're gonna have to dig underneath it so you can't every see time, it anymore. every time you're on the a three three you think god this awful crash must have happened up ahead and it did happen like three thousand years ago i feel like i would drive underneath and go oh we're directly underneath let's slow down yeah 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 let's feel it's sense it really, yeah it's, uh, funny enough i worked for the highway agency whilst i was trying to build it and i'm like you're never going to get permission to do this guy do it. it's like a really old did they get site. it in the end no it got right. stuck, stuck in the bin it's really hard to build tunnels because they're really environmentally um unfriendly and right. expensive but on top of that a bloody english heritage site yeah you've yeah you've got a yeah, recipe yeah. for wasting your money um which is a real shame yeah yeah. Um, Ford in 2020 applied for a patent to match up passengers with um, like things like Ubers, you know, ride sharing. Mm -hmm. Anyway, matching up passengers and the cars by smell. Okay. So you fit a car with sensors, and then if that car smells of 
I don't know, vomit. And then and the passenger <laughs> and you has... smell of vomit. <laughs> then you get that one. Is that right? <laughs> no. Neil, it's the, I think if you've unticked the vomit box, as in you don't want to be in a car smelling of oh, vomit, I then see. you won't be paired That's up. That's clever. So yeah. on a Friday night, 11 o'clock, <laughs> the pubs are kicking out. Yeah really hard to get an uber yeah. you uncheck the vomit thing and you're the only one who wants to get a vomit taxi and so Bingo. there's more taxis available. Yeah yeah, yeah 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 i think it's more for people with things like airborne nut allergies than people <laughs> than, than cars that smell of vomit <laughs> but i think there will be advantages f- for everyone yeah, yeah. So let's say someone's had a peanut in the car and it would be very dangerous for you if you've got a very very oh, very bad right. nut allergy okay. to yeah, get yeah, into yeah. that car so you can sense peanuts yeah yeah i'm trying to think what other smells can be deadly that are important for this patent. It mustard to gas. Exist. <laughs> yes, that's that's not good. Yeah. Uh, on the smell thing, yeah. there's a guy called Henry Cyril Paget. He was the fifth Marquis of Bath, uh, and he was really famous because he in- got an inheritance in 1904, which was equivalent to 30 million pounds per year. And after about five or ten years, he'd accumulated debts of about half a million, and that's 60 million. <sighs> in current money because he just spent it on everything and he modified his car so that his exhaust pipe sprayed perfume so wherever he went there would be a nice little smell of like someone's vaping past you or something lovely and it's quite selfless because you i mean it's his car yeah exactly It's, it's actually a benefit that he will never really feel himself well i think what happened was he thought that all the cars at the time were a bit smelly i'm mm. going to do something a bit different mm. i feel like he's a climate change denier and he's like, what, what climate change? Is she want she? What are you talking about? Um, yeah. This is how uh, profligate he was. He was once at um, a theatre and someone had stolen some of his jewellery and so he needed to get it back. So he enlisted the help of Arthur Conan Doyle to try and find the jewels. <laughs> nice. And he paid Conan Doyle to try and solve the case. Brilliant. God, that's great. Isn't that great? I do like people so who spend good. money well. I mean, yeah. that's a really good way to spend your money. You know, not this fast fashion nonsense. No, like, exactly. you know, 5,000 shirts, or yeah. do you want to hire Luther? Yeah. <laughs> but he'll- Conan Doyle will come up with an incredibly elaborate yeah. mechanism by which it would have been done. He actually, the, he actually, because Did, he was so famous as writing the Sherlock yeah. Holmes books, people used to come to him with mysteries and ask him to solve them. Yeah, and obviously great. they're offering him money and stuff. So and he solved a few. He did. And yeah. he used two methods, didn't he? One was oh, real no. detective science, and the other was spiritualism. So he would get seances <laughs> and he would try and track things down by just the feeling of where it might be. And did he keep two columns of success and failure? Yeah. <laughs> and like, which method worked better? I think he's got wins he... on both. Oh, really? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I wonder if that happens today, you know, if like Dan Brown has people getting in contact with him about I was solving. Who you'd get? Ian Rankin. Yeah. Like a crime. PD James. Richard Osman. Osman. Richard Osman? Oh, yeah. yeah. Osman. Y- your nan goes missing. Richard? <laughs> <laughs> get Richard in. <laughs> um, do you want to hear something, a theory about cup holders? Okay. Mm. okay. Yes. So I was, I was looking into yeah, that's correct answer. I was looking into who developed all the different bits of a car and when they came in. And you know, yeah. so cup holders came in properly in about the eighties, I think. They've been done since the fifties, but they weren't very good. If you were driving, you couldn't really properly stash a drink in a and, and drink from it while driving. Right, so yeah. the, like the decent ones came in in the eighties. Um, just a quick aside: the the car with the most cup holders is apparently the twenty nineteen Subaru Ascent. Any guesses? Sixteen. Ooh. Oh no, like five. Uh, 12. 19. Oh, oh my wow. God. 19 cup holders. Where are the final three that I wasn't thinking of? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, so, okay, why do we like cup holders? There is a theory uh-huh. by a French scholar. Well, because you can keep your change in them. <laughs> Well, yeah. That's kind of, I've never yeah. put a cup in my cup holders. And the I don't keys think. and yeah. the, the car keys. If you, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, here's a theory from, this is printed in the Toronto Star, French born scholar and marketer. G. Clotaire Rapay, who argues that warm drinks as we drive are a replacement for mother's milk. <laughs> oh, he says, I see. He says, what was the key element of safety when you were a child? Oh, no. It was that your mother fed you and there was warm liquid. Yeah. That's why cup holders are absolutely <laughs> crucial. <laughs> uh, I fit in my cup holder with a nipple. Yeah. And I, it's, I find it very comforting when I try. Do you remember, how, I'm sure we must have said this, but there was a theory that in McDonald's, the when you're slurping your milkshake 
they make it the exact consistency so that the amount that you slurp is the same amount that you would when you were breastfeeding. Is that why it's so thick? <laughs> so, wow. you can't, yeah. so you have to suck as hard as you did? That, I mean, I don't think it's true. But there was a theory about that. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> Beautiful theory. It's a, I, I mean, I don't like milk at all. No. Anything to do with milk, I don't like. If I, even if like if you give me a black tea and you use a spoon to stir it that's been in a milky cup I swear I can oh, wow. I can taste it I can't really? stand milk and I'm wondering now if that just says something about possibly me and my relationship with my mother this is well um, I think it says I, everything I, yeah if you don't mind me saying I have the exact opposite so last night <laughs> <laughs> this is true. you're still on the boob last yeah <laughs> I've been wondering for nine years who that woman is. <laughs> the end of every podcast recording. Yeah, um, I, yeah t- I woke up 2 a.m. last night off the back of having a dream about drinking some milk. Got out of bed and I went downstairs and I had a glass of milk. Oh, I mean, and it was full wonderful. Full grown man. Yeah, full grown man. A whole glass of milk. Yeah, 2 a.m. Oh, that's unresolved. Off the back of a dream that made me just salivate wow. so much for it. I wonder it. if your body was um, craving it for something. Like you haven't had enough uh, calcium in your diet. And also something. vitamin D, right? Milk's mm. got vitamin D. And it's been very gloomy in the UK recently. Yeah? Yeah. 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 You can get vitamin D from other things um, than milk, which is vile and <laughs> mucusy. Mm. <laughs> and yeah. smells. I would love to have a... I well, fancy a glass of milk, though, actually. Oh, I think I'm on the downside of the table <laughs> here. So, once you think about it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what are we talking Cars, about? Cars. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Have you heard of um, William Sachiti? No. Um, so William Sachiti is a Zimbabwean-born British entrepreneur, uh, and he has invented something called cargo. And this is possibly going to be the future where they're like little dog-sized cars that go around and deliver things to people's houses okay and they're autonomous like cars so you order your milk let's mm. say you've done fancy a glass of milk <laughs> yep uh, and then he puts in his order and then tesco puts one in a little cargo and it drives it all the way around okay yeah he's basically going mm. against the teslas and the googles as as the big you know who's mm. going to be the big person who does this in the future uh, and this guy um he the first thing he invented was an intelligent robot librarian Cool. Who doesn't want one of those? Um, who was capable of holding a conversation or taking commands and would tell you where the books are that you want. So you say, oh, you know what? I really like this Richard Osman book. What else would I like? And they were like, oh, well, there's a Richard Coles book that's just uh, down here. And come and follow me. And it would kind of drive around and take you to the book. I was sort of picturing an anti-Siri where you'd say like, hey, Siri, and you'd just go, shh. Um, this guy also invented an autonomous penguin uh, that they use at milton Keynes (laughs) university hospital cool and it kind of takes the medicine round to wherever you need it so if you need certain medicine in a certain ward this little penguin will drive around and drive around and take your medicine is it for children's wards or just you know what it's actually for all wards but i think you know it it helps that it is good for children yeah. as well because you don't want like this evil sort of yeah <laughs> T1000 <laughs> yeah, exactly. liquid metal killer <laughs> uh, and the other interesting thing I found about Sajiti is that in 2023 he rescued a zebra from Ukraine and he currently keeps it in his garden in Norfolk wow so, yeah what, it sounds like a, nice a great guy, guy. using God. technology for good yeah rather than mm, evil I you like so. him I think those cargos do sound like a very good idea because it's all about the taking the uh, sort of emissions out of the last mile of delivery isn't it as yeah. in that's where a lot of you know that's where you can really make efficiencies and you know driving vans around all the place but right. they are going to need to be quite well defended mm. as in the number of packages that get nicked from doorsteps they will need to be but how would you up. what would you say like a flamethrower or i'd fit a flamethrower i'd fit <laughs> so I'd, it would be a sliding scale like the ford uh like a bit of interference it just gives you a stern verbal warning do you think that we should get william sachiti to watch robot wars perhaps <laughs> yes <laughs> <laughs> little spikes yeah, yeah. <laughs> Okay, it is time for fact number three, and that is James. Okay, my fact this week is that the healthiest way to eat broccoli is to stir fry it after chopping it into two millimeter pieces and leaving it to stand for an hour and a half. Yeah, we all know that. <laughs> is that how you do yours? Yeah, every day. That's what yeah. it says in your Hello Fresh. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Christ, that's a difficult instruction. <laughs> so this is because they have a compound called sulforaphane. And sulforaphane is really hard to get at. Um, you can get it quite well if you eat it raw. 
Um, but as soon as you start cooking broccoli, it kind of degenerates and you don't get as much. You still get it, but you don't get quite as much. And there was some Chinese re researchers in the Journal of Agricultural and Food Chemistry, and they tried loads of different ways of cooking broccoli, to see which ways gets the most sulforaphane. And they found this way, you know, they chopped it into tiny, tiny pieces mm. because actually it's almost a defense for the broccoli. It's trying to stop herbivores <laughs> from eating it. And so it puts this oh. chemical out to stop like nice. cows from eating it. Nice so. try, idiot. You're in my kitchen. There's no way you're not going to eat it. Yeah, so like the way to get this out is to kind of macerate it or, or chop it up or whatever. So that's why you do the small oh. chopping. All right. Uh, and then if you leave it for a long time, it helps the, the sulforaphane to come out. And then you do a quick stir fry. Bish, bash, bosh. But it's two millimeters. I, I gotta say, it feels a bit like you'll have a kind of mince <clears throat> of broccoli, and yeah. I, I like yes. the crunch of a floret. Do you? I yeah, agreed. a bit like yeah. um, cauliflower rice. I imagine it would be. Which I hate. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I've got a testimony to do with sulforaphane. Oh yeah. Because a few. I used to have really bad tendonitis in my knees, right? Really bad. And unfortunately, when you're not an athlete, people don't care when your joints hurt. <laughs> <They're> like, <laughs> Get over it, Athena. Um, and then at the same time, years ago, it became a. a uh, became apparent that sulforaphane was good for your joints. And I was like, it can't hurt. So I started having kale and broccoli smoothies, right? Because nice. I was like, they were trying to figure out how to extract the sulforaphane into like a tablet. And I was like, well, I haven't, yeah. got, I haven't got time to wait for this, you know? <laughs> so, um, and I, I honestly, after about a few weeks, if not months of doing, eating just loads of broccoli and having loads of broccoli and kale, kale smoothies, I am no word for lie, my tendonitis cleared up really oh, absolutely yeah. yeah this is anecdotal it wasn't a scientific study so i you mm. know i went, got, got off the running uh, treadmill and off the pavement and started cycling and all this kind of stuff but after huh. a few weeks and months the tendonitis cleared up and i've not had it since okay that's, that's really brilliant. interesting yeah. would a would a uh, skeptic say placebo for that do you think or well, do you think well you know what skeptics right yeah skeptics just need to get on board <laughs> um the athena train yeah. yeah and that's my response to all skeptics on anything they say right, get on board <laughs> the <laughs> athena train so train definitely does work yeah, oh no i'm just wondering the of... method of the smoothie whether or not that well oh, it no, depends I'm, if you're yeah. having a fair bit so th there are pills these days which they, you'll be glad to know, Athena, they completed the process, they oh. made the pills. <laughs> what a yeah. And the pill, I, I, in fact, the, the pills might be even more effective than broccoli and kale smoothies. I don't know how much you were having. I mean, it sounds like a, a fair bit. I was Honestly, I would buy like three or four florets a week and I'd get through them in either steaming or having my smoothie because I was my knees were I was in agony I couldn't oh. watch a film I couldn't go to the theatre because every time my knees were bent yeah, yeah. for more than oh, like yeah, a minute yeah, yeah. It, it, they would just be on fire yeah, um, yeah. so I had yeah I'd say I've, and uh, yeah three or four fluids okay. a week uh, so a lot a so lot yeah. that is a lot that absolutely is a lot these pills are equivalent to eating five kilos of broccoli <laughs> every day <laughs> Wow, Which that's possibly that. more, yeah. <laughs> Slightly more. Yeah. But the other thing is that you can overdo it like with anything, right? Yes. And if you have too much sulforaphane, you are supposedly at risk of hypothyroidism, uh, which will make you tired and... Oh, right. And, yeah. Well, it's a line. So don't eat six kilos of broccoli yeah, a day. Yeah. Yeah. Just yeah. balanced diet. It's like yeah. what we always say. But yeah, yeah. It, I mean, it's good stuff. Um, my favourite broccoli <laughs> is... <laughs> Cubby broccoli. Oh, oh come oh, on. Oh, already, God. already. You're well, hang, on, okay. hang on, though. Hang on, though. There's a really interesting fact about Cubby broccoli. Cubby broccoli was the producer of the James Bond movies. The broccoli family still produce them to this mm. day. Cubby broccoli, in an interview that he gave in the 1980s to the LA Times, made the claim that broccoli, the vegetable, is named after him. He's lying. Okay. The broccoli <laughs> family. Yeah. So uh, he says that his his father, who was called Giovanni, and his brother, Giovanni's brother, they immigrated to Long Island from Calabria at the turn of the 20th yeah. century. Italy. He says, yeah, in Italy, sorry. He says that that broccoli family were descended from the broccolis of Carrera, who were the first to cross cauliflower and rab to produce the broccoli. Therefore, oh. broccoli is named after him, not yeah. vice versa. When people say, "Are oh, you named after the vegetable?" Pretty good. I mean, that yeah. sounds very convincing. I yeah. have to say, well, the, yeah. it was an Italian thing. Like the first farmers to grow broccoli, the modern broccoli that we consider broccoli today, were in the south of Italy. It's definitely a man-made thing, as it yeah. was from the cabbage family, but they were bred that way, right? Yeah, uh, and it was invented in Italy. Yeah. Well, I think possibly just named because it's Italian for shoots or something. Yeah, right? that's knows? the etymology, isn't it? It's a sort yeah. of, and it's the same word, same as brooch. Right. The, same, the brooch and broccoli have the same 
etymological root. Yes. Yeah. So that right. might be. And I know the Romans had a version of broccoli. Yeah. But I don't think they had our lovely classic green broccoli. Well, one thing they definitely didn't have is tender stem broccoli. Is this, that what we've got? This is so tender stem broccoli is where it's quite a long stem and Ooh, then there's yeah. little broccoli florets on the top and you can eat the whole thing. That's right? posh broccoli. Yeah, oh, yeah. Posh broccoli. It's delicious, guys. It's, yeah, yeah. Oh, it's yeah. brilliant. Oh, yeah. But this is one of the most amazing things I've ever found. <laughs> tender stem broccoli was invented about ten years ago by a committee. Oh, really? <laughs> in Japan, and it's a registered trademark. Isn't it amazing? It used to. They originally they called it aspiration when they invented it. Oh, because it looks like an asparagus. Exactly. That's yeah. where they got it from. Brilliant. Wow. And yeah, they were just had this session where a load of people at the Sakata Seed Incorporation in Yokohama sat around the table and went, "You know what? We should do. We should make broccoli where you can eat the whole thing. How would we do that? Well, what if we mixed it with Chinese kale?" Okay, let's try it. And they right. tried it. And now they patent the seeds and they sell the seeds around the world. Are you saying wow. actually 10 years? About 10 years. Are you saying in I the last 20 years, for sure. You, but you're saying I couldn't have seen in the millennium with a nice dish of tender It would have been broccoli. close. Like, it was certainly around, <laughs> it was around that time when they started coming in. I okay, thought I, could... I never saw these because they were really expensive. It's... Oh, so you're like, oh, I'm doing well in the world now yeah. that I've been introduced to a new broccoli. <laughs> <laughs> it's new. utterly bizarre, isn't wow. it? And they called them Aspiration. Yeah. And they tried to sell them like that. And then Debbie Nucci, who is the wife of the company's chief operating officer, mm. she came up with the name Broccolini. And that's what they're called oh, in America. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and Perfect. then it was Marks and Spencer started calling them Tender Stem okay. in the UK. Wow. wow. So let me get this right. You're saying you think that's more amazing than the fact that the James Bond producer Well, that's not true, us. what you said. <laughs> <laughs> the bit that I said is <laughs> it's verifiably true. Yours is just okay, made think, up. All right, that's a milkshake nipple of the McDonald's man. <laughs> but that's not going to become a thing that my name is now milkshake nipple McDonald's man. It's catchy. Say? And it fits. It's it's if the cap fits. If the nipple fits. <laughs> They love broccoli in Japan, though, don't they? They, Do they? like really? to the point. Yeah, yeah. So to the point where yeah. kids particularly love it. And there's a story which is Pixar. You know the movie Inside Out that yeah. they did. There's a scene in that where it, 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 it? It, was a, it was a movie about emotions. It was a real kind of poignant. They al- had characters like one of them was sad and one, one of them yeah. angry. Whatever, it was all yeah. in one person's head. Yes. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah exactly. Okay. And in it, there's a scene where they eat broccoli and they go, "It's yucky" or whatever. And they swap that. They swap that out for the Japanese edition because broccoli is loved by oh. kids there. What so did they put it instead? They put instead... Because they don't like milk, do they? Oh, I think yeah. famously in Japan. Uh-huh. That wouldn't go down well in my house. <laughs> <laughs> Turn it off. <laughs> the cat's in Disney Plus. It's done. <laughs> uh, green peppers. Oh, uh, green peppers. Yeah, that's what they replaced oh, it with. But isn't there like a substance that makes green vegetables taste horrible to kids? Oh, well, yeah, And it's is. in Brussels sprouts and things like that. It's really bitter, right? Yeah. 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 And there's, it's, it's so some people... So it happens a lot with children, and I think children have extra taste buds. But there is a gene, which I have written down, which is called TAS2R38, and that lets you taste bitterness. And there's a variant of that gene, and if you get two versions of one particular variant, then your whole life, not just when you're a child, you experience all the Brassica family as being unbelievably foul and bitter really? and horrible. It was really interesting. My wife, when she was pregnant, she craved broccoli and tender stem. Mm. And then after about a month, she couldn't be in the same room as it. Mm. Uh, but didn't have the heart to tell me because I started making her loads of things with broccoli in it. Because she was like, oh yeah, I really want broccoli. I'm like, great, I'll make broccoli soup. I'll make broccoli this, broccoli that. And then she just found it so disgusting. She huh. couldn't be near it. Maybe that was the response. Like, Here's your broccoli cake, darling. Happy birthday. <laughs> 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 You're absolutely right. It's amazing how it can quickly turn. (laughs) (laughs) Broccoli everything, yeah. Yeah, it could have been more of a comment on my cooking than anything else. (laughs) It's in two minute pieces, darling. (laughs) I made it exactly as they told me to. (laughs) Oh, this is a cool thing. This is slightly tangential. I hope you don't mind. Ah, fine. Please. Okay, great. Have you heard of epicuticular wax? Uh, No. Right. This is a wax that covers lots of vegetables, right? That is water repellent. And loads yeah. and loads of vegetables, including broccoli, have epicuticular. Naturally. Or we naturally. Add it. Yeah, okay. naturally. So like epiderm, mm. like the epidermis is the top layer of skin and cuticular, the uh, cuticles. So it's, it's, it's the surface layer. And um, it's, it's to protect the plant from water getting in from outside. Yeah. And all the rubbish that might be in external water, it might have bacteria in it, it might be dangerous, there might be molds, sure. all of that. And this is why, you know, when you wet kale... You know when you go out and wet some kale. Oh, yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, we all go out on like, <laughs> kale wetting expeditions. <laughs> yeah. But you might rinse some kale before cooking it, and the water just seems to stick on the surface. Yeah, it's yeah. droplets. It splashes. It makes a mess. Water goes everywhere. It, literally, it literally is like it's alive, and it's rejecting <laughs> the water. Yeah. Well, it is, and it is. And it's because of epicuticular wax. Oh. And it's why when you boil kale, sometimes it leaves a like a, a ring, yeah. like a right. ring on the bathtub. It's like water off a duck's back, water oh. off kale's epicuticular wax. wax. Yeah. yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And it's um it's super hydrophobic yeah. in some plants. That's you know. really clever. Yeah, and we, it, yeah. it feels like you know what really hydrophobic things we tend to use them as lubricants like oil and stuff like that, right? Yeah, it feels like you could use this kale as a lubricant. <laughs> It's going to struggle to sell in Ann Summers, I think. <laughs> Do you think the special vegan section of Ann Summers? Would sell, yeah. No, I think that's sell. a you're big right, You're right, you're right. Yeah. yeah. I wasn't thinking sexual. I was thinking... Oh, know, please. Yeah. I said lubricant <laughs> and sex never... Ca- I just... What? Wow, when, how did you get there? When James says lubricant, he thinks of complicated machine tool processes. <laughs> Go back to your milkshake. <laughs> 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 Okay, it is time for our final fact of the show, and that is my fact. My fact this week is that last year, on December 23rd, a hospital in Doncaster accidentally sent a text message to thousands of its patients informing them that they had an aggressive terminal disease. What they had meant to send was a message reading, Merry Christmas and have a Happy New Year. So, <laughs> oh God, this is oh boy. a That's very awful. unfortunate moment. And I should say that while obviously it's a it's in theory a hilarious cock up, this caused chaos. Yeah. This caused horrible, horrible moments for people in Doncaster. And the center of which the text went out from, there's about eight thousand people signed there. So this was their mailing list yeah. basically so, through text messages. Some of them some of them had, had tests. Some recently. of them had tests, some of them were yeah. rating on results, some yeah. of them were there was a lady who ran out of her house and she ran around the corner because she was so petrified and she saw six people in the street all out there as well, going, I've oh just been God. so everyone, it was just like a national You know what it reminds me of? Do you remember that Hawaiian um, yeah, they, missile. everyone got the yeah, missile. Everyone got a text message saying there was a nuclear missile coming <laughs> yeah, to Hawaii. Exactly, they and had everyone minutes. believed it for about fifteen minutes or something. It was yeah. a long time, but I think some people were going to shelters, and the guy who had sent the message had, had done it before as well. I think it was his second offence. <laughs> Twice, <out>. before, he'd, <laughs> Twice before he'd mistook. What it but was, he's like, it's okay, I'm just going to move to Doncaster. <laughs> <laughs> Won't ever have this problem like, again. Witness protection. <laughs> oh. Yeah, what happened with that was that a call had came in to do a test for a missile launch, and the guy who pressed the button, there's two buttons that you can press, one that says test missile alert, and then missile alert. Oh, and isn't it like a drop-down menu? Yeah, And exactly. they're next to each other because they're alphabetically yeah. <laughs> so but close he, to each other. But like it's not like he, it's not like he yeah. picked the wrong thing. He picked missile alert because he was oh. overhearing the conversation and he said what happened was that the guy who had the person on the phone saying this is a test, this is a test or whatever wording it was right. said that to the to the phone that was on the ear of the guy receiving it and then he put it on to speakerphone so the man who pressed the button didn't hear the this is a test just heard the next bit just heard missile and was clearly a paranoid guy so he just pressed the button so oh. it wasn't only text messages it was also the TVs it came on the TV it yeah. came over the you radio a paranoid guy but maybe he was just doing his job well he was doing his job yeah. but he'd done it wrong three times in total <laughs> so it, <laughs> they had to let him was go was it just an amusing thing each time it was an amusing thing that made him stop hearing this is a test yeah you know like <laughs> someone would drop a you know. a siren just drives by. Yeah. <laughs> well, there was a school there in Hawaii where the students they ran out after hearing all mm. the all the text messages and on TV and they ran to the fallout shelters built specifically for missiles and so mm. on got there but they were locked so they had to run back into the school so they couldn't even use the thing built for them to That's do stressful. it and there were people were reporting people driving 100 miles an hour down the road desperately trying to get home it was an amazing thing. I have a book, by the way, which is my favorite novel uh, of recent years I've read by Jim Carrey, my com- you know, the comedian. And the cover of it is his face. It's done a bit artistically, but it's his face. And Jim Carrey was writing that book while that missile was launched in Hawaii. And he was doing FaceTime with his assistant who called him up saying, we have minutes to live. And she accidentally took a screen grab the second oh, his accidentally. face was like this is going to be a billion on ebay <laughs> she was there as well so i <laughs> think she right. had minutes to make that money you'd want to see what a guy with one of the funniest faces in the world yeah. Yeah. does he was in the mask right so as soon as they told him his eyes <laughs> yeah. would pop out and like, oh, my dad. all righty then you've got four minutes to make the funniest face 
<laughs> like get Carey, Rowan Atkinson, a few others, and just workshop it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. This isn't really about systems and protocol because I've had lots of jobs. I used to do like business development, right? You'd right. go into companies and they would have a process for doing things, and you'd say, "Well, this process works and doesn't work for these reasons." So this is a really good example of it's not actually that guy's fault for pressing the nuclear test button. It's the process, right? So you know, yeah. In, yeah. in movies in America, there's this mad process they've got to do to like actually send the bombs. They've got to read codes. Yeah, they've got yeah, to yeah. Um, do dances. <laughs> <laughs> you know I mean? they've, yeah. they've got to play charades. So like, you've got to complete the game of mousetrap. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then you've got that. You know those games where you've got uh, like a, a metal uh, wire, <laughs> yes. and you and you've got to take something over without making something making noise or whatever. And you've got yeah, preparation. Yeah. But the whole point of that is so you don't just like start firing missiles by accident. It is unequivocal. Yeah. This is what we want you to do. Having a oh. It's I'm just gonna put you on speaker. But <laughs> 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 there's like a three second delay, only one person's responsible, there's a drop down list. These are all things. If I was going into that office, I'd be like, oh, yeah, you need to change yeah. your processes, yeah, yeah. mate. That mistake shouldn't have happened with the Doncaster thing, Absolutely, right? Yeah. That's a process thing, right? Yes. There. Yeah. Yeah. there used to be, there was an idea, a theory by someone, and I forgive me, I can't remember who it was, but they said that they should put the nuclear codes inside a person. And that person should be with the president at all times. Yes. So if the president ever needed to send a nuke, they would have to kill that person. And suddenly it becomes more real for the president. He's not just pressing any old button. Is it that the president has to literally stab yeah, the guy yeah. and, and... I don't think it would be the president. No, it's the president who has to... Yeah, no, the president, gut, the president has, has to gut the assistant. Because right. the get... idea is that then the president who's making that decision has to make a more immediate decision before yeah. he can but just press a button. Couldn't it be a cat? Lots, there are <laughs> like... A giant river otter <laughs> with the president <laughs> at all times. Because all the president's got to make a lot of life and death decisions. Yeah. Who applies for that job as well? Like, who comes home and goes, honey, you got a great well, gig, I'm working with the president. You might... You know, we've never had we've, a nuclear yeah. Okay, war so you might never break out. You will probably... Yeah. Just serve your time. In theory, you yeah. could just sit around doing nothing for 30 years and then... Get to go wherever the president goes. You'll see amazing rooms. Oh my God, this is a great thing. You probably yeah. can't put on too much weight because then he would be more difficult for him to stab you. <laughs> oh, yeah. 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 rules. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, You've got to have a big tattoo of cut here. Cut here. <laughs> a little, <laughs> little scissor line inserted on, on you. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah. That's a bit stressful, but you know. But then wouldn't wouldn't the sort of the enemy try and kidnap you and, and get the codes out of your chest oh, yeah, as well? Oh, yeah, that is true. Don't you become a... Yeah, because we know you would probably is. have to have about ten people, all of whom were with yeah. the president, but only the president knows which one it is. Oh wow! Yes, yeah, oh, yeah, that's yeah. Gr- that's yeah, a great okay. idea. Yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. So you've all got the tattoo. Yeah. yeah. Well, maybe want- everyone in America has one. And <laughs> <laughs> it's getting complicated, isn't it? It's getting harder to. Um, just on uh, on text messages. Yeah. This text message oh, is yeah. meant to say. Merry Christmas and have a happy New Year. Yeah. And that's very apt. It is because the first ever text message said. You have an aggressive term in order. No, it said, it, said <laughs> it was a Merry Christmas. It was a Merry Christmas message. Yeah. It was That's sent great. by a man called Neil Papworth. Oh. It was in the. It was in 1992 on the 1992. 3rd of December. There we go. But imagine getting the first ever text. And also, 3rd of December, a bit early. Yeah. That's the thing. <laughs> Vodafone were having the Christmas party on the 3rd of December. Oh, Vodafone were having a party, I believe, to celebrate the sending of the first ever text message. So oh. this guy, Papworth, sent the message to the oh. head of Vodafone. Oh. Or the Richard Richard Jarvis, who was a big wig at Vodafone. I believe it was a party partly to celebrate yeah. this technology happening. Huh. And it's and he had to, but he had to text it from a computer because phones at the time didn't have the capacity to text. Yeah. But the phone the that Richard Jarvis received it on weighed two kilos. Oh. And that's a, that's about I think twelve modern iPhones. As in yeah. Just reminds you of what phones have been like in very oh, very big. living memory. Uh, there's a guy called Brian Moore. Uh, he's designed a device that won't let you type the word lol unless it has actually detected you laughing out loud. <laughs> That's <laughs> so good. Great. It's a good idea, that, isn't it? That's great. Weirdly, I text hat when I am laughing. Yeah. But I would never send lol, even if I'm really laughing out loud. No. That would be ha ha. <laughs> I but, do pa ha 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 ha. So you like kind of I'm oh, laughing yeah, yeah. a lot. Like, I do yeah. wah ha 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 ha. But I am a villain. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I think you would be able to program it so it wouldn't let you say ha ha unless oh, you were okay. um, unless you were laughing out loud. And it also doesn't let you write ruffle unless you're actually rolling on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> What about pissing myself laughing? <laughs> <laughs> the moisture sensors. Yeah. Wow. Inserted laughing scuff. my ass off. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, okay. The fastest ever text message. Oh, this yeah. is a, just a little weird uh, fun record. Okay. Well, like, like just KK. So th- there's a specific message which you have to send uh, for okay. this record. Right. Do we know what it is? We do. 
Um, so okay, I'll, t- I'll tell you the record first, right? Okay. So the, this was broken. It may have been rebroken since, but it was 2010. British woman Melissa Thompson. She okay. sent this message. It's 26 words, and she managed it in 25.94 seconds. Okay, that's pretty good. It's, well, it's right. word. It doesn't sound. Yeah, second word sounds quite beatable, though, doesn't it? Mm. Here's the message. The razor-toothed piranhas of the genera <laughs> Serasalmus and Pygocentrus are the most ferocious freshwater fish in the world. In reality, they seldom attack a human. Lol. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that's what she managed in oh, wow. 25 seconds. Okay, that is impressive. Yeah. It's a predictive test. I, I imagine piranha is not necessarily going to come up. Piranha would, but I would say the, um, the name of the species yeah, would because I actually, would not. I've actually never heard those words before no she would learn them beforehand I guess or I think so yeah because it's the sentence you'd know and it's a real Fosbury flopper though Melissa's record because oh. in 2004 the same record with the same sentence was broken by a Sussex man called James Trussler and he took 67 seconds to do it and she took under 26 seconds to do wow. it wow right. did she have a special technique that Oh, I don't. I wasn't like I don't know if it was like Bob, Fosbury. No. Yeah, yeah. But it's but That's it's a huge it's, difference. Yes. Yeah. Maybe yeah. she was the first person to ever use her thumb rather than <laughs> typing with her next yeah, fingers. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> or like you know the old Nokia, you have to press each button three times. Yeah. A B C. Yeah, 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 yeah. All that. So yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. yeah. Good and, for whoever that was. And good for if you're stuck with a piranha as well. Yeah. Because they seldom <laughs> attack a human. <laughs> ah. <Stop> <laughs> <it>. <laughs> um, I think I think about texting. Yeah, it was so profitable. Oh, it's when it comes, it, I mean, like ten p a text, wasn't mm. it? We're all of an age to remember ten p texts. Yeah, it didn't cost ten p to send it that data. Feel like it. Doesn't feel like it did. And so I, I did a little looking into it, and basically the profits were unbelievably huge for mobile phone phones. It brought in over. And people the, were sending like a billion, weren't they? Like the world yeah. was sending. And you'd get on your plan. Sorry for any younger listeners, but you get, you know, <laughs> you get a certain number of minutes and maybe two hundred texts a month, yeah. or five hundred texts a month, and you had to like you get right up to the wire of how many texts you were allowed to send because then it was charging you ten p a minute. Anyway, in two thousand one, it cost ten p, like you said, James, uh, which was one hundred and twenty eight bytes of data for one hundred and sixty wow. characters. Right. Uh-huh. The Guardian calculated that if it was ch- if it was charged at that rate, buying a standard music CD would cost sixty thousand pounds. Oh my god! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> The, the text message was just banality, right? It wasn't even like, it wasn't 10p worth of information. It was mostly flirting. Um, well, mine were all doing. about piranhas and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was wondering how old WhatsApp was. All right, I'm going to guess this. Oh, okay, I, don't, you, you have I, a guess I must say, I don't know the answer, but Dan's oh. got his laptop, so you can check. I can you check, have, yeah. You have a guess first, Athena. I think eight years old. Nice. Okay, so that's what, 2015? Uh, yeah. Okay, because James got us earlier with the 10 to 10 broccoli, right? Oh. Yeah. Like it's invented 20 years ago. So I'm going to guess 1492. Ah. <laughs> like it's actually. You're, you're not older. closer, but you're closer to what I'm going to say. Okay. Um, so, first of all, Dan, what was the answer? Well, is it older or younger than broccoli? Broccolini. Oh, God, I, because that I think broccolini, I reckon, actually came in around the turn of the millennium, okay. really. It's, okay. So it must be younger than that. Yeah, I'd, I'd right. say that. Yeah. Yes, it is. Yeah, yeah. Go on. Two thousand nine. Two thousand nine. Okay. Well, I found a WhatsApp from nineteen oh eight, and <laughs> <laughs> this is what I just thought I'd go in the um, newspaper archives and search for WhatsApp and see what came up. And this was from the Masson Telegraph of the twenty sixth of September nineteen oh eight, and it was about the um, someone being sued for breaking up an engagement. And this was the first time that had ever happened in Albany in Georgia, uh, and it was a businessman called J E Sapp, and he had teamed up with a guy called Mister Watt, and they owned a hardware shop in Georgia called Watt Sapp. Get out. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Uh, The WhatsApp hardware store existed for a small amount of time in 1908 in Albany, Georgia. Wow. Superb. (laughs) And the proprietor was going around breaking up engagements. Well, well, that's he... what WhatsApp is used for, really. <laughs> <laughs> in, many, in many ways. It's just couples having arguments. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's it. That is all of our facts. Thank you so much for listening. If you'd like to get in contact with any of us about the things that we've said over the course of this podcast, we can be found on our Twitter accounts. I'm on at Schreiberland, Andy. At Andrew Hunter M. James. At James Harkin. And Athena. Athena Kablenu. But don't come to me. I don't know nothing. 
<laughs> uh, yeah, or you can go to our group account at no such thing or email us on podcast at qi.com or do go to our website, no such thing as a fish.com. All of our previous episodes are up there. But more importantly, make sure to check out Athena's podcast. Uh, how long has it been going now? Oh, we're on episode five. Episode uh, five. The last one was about a friend of ours, you got the snip. Wow. Yeah, right? You nodded way too enthusiastically. <laughs> <laughs> Your kids must be stressful, man. Yeah, like, <laughs> so oh, you're like, that sounds snip. good. Yeah. I hadn't thought of that. Um, but it's called Why Does My Child Hate Me? It's about kids <laughs> and how they're the problem, not us. We're brilliant. <laughs> so <laughs> check that kids out. Kids are now. nuts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, otherwise, we'll be back again next week. We'll see you then. Goodbye.